Okay, so let's continue our uh, study of sequences of real numbers. So, um, so we've seen special uh, types of sequences, monotone sequences, uh, before, and then in the previous lecture, um, we looked at uh, sequences obtained from sequences, uh, um, namely the sequences that give you the limb soup and limb inf. And we showed that these are actually limits of subsequences. Um, now I'm going to define what looks like a new class of sequences, but we'll see it's actually not. These are called Cauchy sequences. So Cauchy, not Couchy, not Cauchy, uh, Cauchy. So French guy, so it's pronounced Cauchy, uh, and probably not even pronounced like that. It's probably uh, got a different pronunciation um, by people who actually speak French. So what is the definition of a Cauchy sequence? A Cauchy sequence is um, intuitively it's a sequence so that um, if you go far enough out in the sequence, any two entries in that sequence are close together. Okay, so convergent sequences had the property that if you go far enough out, the, L, the entries in the sequence are getting close to a real number. Cauchy sequence is that any two entries are close to each other. So, um, so a Cauchy sequence so we say a sequence is Cauchy if for all epsilon positive, there exists an M, natural number, such that if M is bigger than or equal to M, and K is bigger than or equal to M, then Xn minus Xk is less than epsilon. So maybe not, let me not write if, I mean, it's the same statement, but since it looks a little, so it'll look a little more like previous uh, uh, statements, let me put it for all there. So uh, you have a definition here. You should, um, it's a definition of a new uh, thing. You should now try to look at an example and then possibly negate the definition to see if you really understand it. So an example of a Cauchy sequence is x of n equals 1 over n, our favorite sequence. So let's prove this. We have to, so all we have is the definition. So we have to verify that x of n equals 1 over n verifies the definition of being Cauchy. So just like when we try to prove something is convergent, it's, which is a for all epsilon statement, uh, the first thing you have to do is let epsilon be positive. And then I have to choose M and show that that capital M produces this statement here. So choose M, a natural number, so that 1 over M is less than epsilon over 2. So I could phrase that as capital M being bigger than 2 over epsilon, but I'm going to phrase it this way. Now we have to show that it works. Namely, if I take n bigger than or equal to capital M and k bigger than or equal to capital M, then this difference is less than epsilon. Then if n is bigger than or equal to m, k is bigger than or equal to m, and I look at 1 over n minus 1 over k, uh, this is less than or equal to, by the triangle inequality, the absolute value of uh, each of these added together, which is just 1 over n plus 1 over k. And since these are both bigger than or equal to m, this is big. each one is less than or equal to 1 over m, 1 over m. So I get 2 over m, which by our choice of m is less than epsilon. Okay? So x sub n equals 1 over n is an example of a Cauchy sequence. So let's negate the definition. And then we'll uh, 
obtain, uh, look at an example of a sequence which is not Cauchy. And as you'll probably guess, if this is our favorite sequence which converges, this our favorite sequence which doesn't converge uh, will be an example of a sequence which um, is not Cauchy. And this shouldn't, shouldn't come as a surprise because, uh, again, a sequence which is Cauchy, if you go far enough out, any two entries are close to each other, okay? But if we look at, for example, the sequence minus one to the n, which is just minus one plus one minus one, any two entries will differ by, um, or you can always choose two entries that differ uh, by two um, in distance. So let's negate this definition to um, get what it means for something not to be Cauchy. So let me now write all that out. Um, X sub n is not Cauchy if, so every time we see a for all, it becomes a there exists. Um, if there exists a bad epsilon not positive such that for all m a natural number, you can find two entries further out than m that are within, that are greater than epsilon not distance to each other. So there exists n bigger than or equal to m and k bigger than or equal to m such that x sub n minus x sub k bigger than or equal to this bad epsilon. Okay. So again, I mean, the definition of Cauchy means that as long as I go far enough out uh, in uh, the sequence, this distance is supposed to be less than epsilon. So for all epsilon positive, there exists a capital M. So that I have this picture, if I choose X sub uh, k plus 1, then it should also be uh, within distance epsilon to x sub n or x sub k. So they're getting closer and closer together. The negation means that they're not getting closer and closer together to each other. So there exists some small distance so that you can always go as far out as you want and find two entries um, that are greater than epsilon not distance to each other. So what's an example of that? Um, like I said, the sequence minus 1 to the n is not Cauchy. Okay? That looks... That just doesn't look right. There we go. Now it is. Okay. So this is not Cauchy. So that means there should exist some bad epsilon naught. So I can go far enough out. Uh, so I can go as far out as I want and find two entries in the sequence differing from each other by epsilon naught in distance. So basically any two entries other than, you know, I can always find two entries in the sequence which differ from each other by uh, two. So that'll be my bad epsilon naught. Um, so if you like, here's a proof. Choose epsilon naught equals two. Let m be a natural number. So now we have to find uh, an element of this uh, entries in the sequence further out than m, whose distance to each other is bigger than or equal to two. We can just take m plus one uh, and capital M. Choose n equals m, and k equals m plus 1. So these are both bigger than or equal to m. Then minus 1 to the n, minus 1 to the k. This is equal to um, 1 minus minus 1. After I factor out uh, a minus 1 to the capital M, which equals 2. Minus 1 to the n is not Cauchy. All right, so I, uh, at the beginning, said that um, 
this will look like a definition of a new um, type of sequence, but it's not really. So, as it turns out, um, so the elements of the sequence are getting closer and closer together um, as you go far enough out. Um, so they're all kind of clustering near each other, which kind of makes you think they're all clustering near something in the real number line. Um, and therefore, maybe the sequence is convergent. Now, uh, this is true, and we'll prove this, is that uh, every, that a sequence is Cauchy if and only if it's convergent. <coughs> now, this is true only for the real numbers, and I'll say a, a little bit uh, about this in a minute or not only true for the real numbers, but it's not true for the rational numbers. Um, and I'll get to that uh, in just a second. So what we're going to prove is that a sequence is Cauchy if and only if it is convergent. So the first thing I want to show is that Cauchy sequences are bounded. So the proof of this statement is essentially the same as, um, as the proof that uh, convergent sequences are bounded. So let me draw a picture that goes along with this proof. So as long as I go far enough out, there exists an M so that for all N bigger than or equal to capital M, I can say this. Let's look at this entry X sub M then for all n bigger than or equal to capital M, all of the other entries have to be within uh, a certain distance to x sub n based on the definition of, of Cauchy. So let's say uh, I make that distance 1. And let's say 0 is over here just for this picture. So then for all n bigger than or equal to x sub n, uh, for all n bigger than or equal to capital M, x sub n lies in this interval here. Okay, and therefore, we'll get that x sub n is um, bounded. So the way this picture looks, I'm going to write it this way, x1 plus 1. Okay, now that handles all n bigger than or equal to capital M, so we just need to deal with the first capital M minus 1 uh, other guys, so maybe there's capital M minus 1 is over here, capital X sub 1 is over there, capital X sub 2 is over here. So then our bound will just be uh, this one, which handles all of the n bigger than or equal to m, plus the uh, um, absolute values of these guys that we missed. Okay? All right, so... Since Xn is Cauchy, exist an M, natural number, such that for all N bigger than or equal to M, K bigger than or equal to M, X sub N minus X sub K is less than 1 uh, in distance. So this is certainly true for uh, K equals capital M. So this implies for all n bigger than or equal to m, uh, x sub n minus x sub capital M is less than 1. So now if I use the triangle inequality, I can show uh, that the previous implies that for all n bigger than or equal to m, if I look at the absolute value of x sub n, this is equal to x sub n minus x sub capital M plus capital M. And this is less than or equal to the absolute value of this guy plus the absolute value of this guy. And this is bounded by 1. OK? So in summary, I've shown that for all n bigger than or equal to this fixed integer capital M, uh, x sub n is less than or equal to uh, X sub capital M in absolute value plus 1. Okay? So 
So that's for all little n bigger than or equal to capital M. So now I just need to pick a big enough number that bounds the first capital M uh, entries that are not covered by this inequality. Okay? Capital M is fixed. All right? Um, so let B be the absolute value of x of 1 plus absolute value of x of 2 plus So this fixed number now, then for all n bigger than or equal to capital M, I have by this inequality up here, this is a sum of non-negative numbers, so this number is certainly bigger than or equal to just this part. And if uh, I have n bigger uh, than equal to 1 and less than m, then x sub n is going to be, the absolute value of this guy is going to be one of these that appears here, which is certainly less than or equal to if I uh, add on uh, this number and the others, which is less than or equal to b. Okay, so now I've found a b, which is non-negative, which bounds all the absolute values, and therefore, uh, this proves that the sequence is bounded. Um, okay, so we've shown that a Cauchy sequence is bounded, and um, so what? Uh, what I'm now going to show is the following. So, again, all of the entries are getting close to each other. They're kind of clustering near each other. So, uh, it kind of feels like they want to converge. And this next theorem says that, well, if you've identified a limit uh, along a subsequence, then, in fact, the entire sequence converges. Okay? So, of course, this is not true for uh, an arbitrary sequence. If a subsequence converges, um, or I should say, for an arbitrary sequence, it does not, it's not true that a subsequence converging implies a full sequence converging, right? We have minus 1 to the n for which a uh, subsequence converges, but the whole sequence does not converge. But if we make the additional hypothesis that the sequence is Cauchy, then uh, the sequence converges if and only if uh, a sub, that subsequence converges. So the um, statement of the theorem is the following. If x sub n is Cauchy, and there exists a subsequence, uh, which is converging to some number, call it x. then the sequence, full sequence, converges to x. Okay? So if I have, so if I, what I was saying right before I stated this theorem is that if I hide this part and just say there exists a subsequence which is converging to x, uh, this does not imply that the full sequence converges to x because we have this example of minus 1 to the n. But if I also assume the sequence is Cauchy, then it does follow that Cauchy plus subsequence converging implies the full sequence converges. Okay, so I want to show uh, that xn converges to x, so I want to show and we're going to do this just by using the definition uh, by verifying this through the definition, not using the squeeze theorem or anything like that. So let epsilon be positive. Since xn is Cauchy,
there exists um, m naught natural number such that for all n bigger than or equal to m naught and k bigger than or equal to m naught. x of n minus x of k is less than epsilon over 2. Why this epsilon over 2? Well, we have, or why should you not be surprised? Well, we have two assumptions here. So, you know, like we did when we did uh, convergence of products of sequences and so on, which, include, which had two assumptions, namely two sequences converged to something. Typically, that means we'll have two integers coming. We'll choose a bigger integer. Uh, and then sum up inequalities to get an epsilon. So uh, that's a little bit of a rambling answer to why we get an epsilon over 2 here, or why we put one there. Since the subsequence, so I didn't, uh, the subsequence uh, converges to x. There exists another integer, m sub 1, such that if k is bigger than or equal to m sub 1, then x sub n sub k minus x is less than epsilon over 2. So maybe I should have used a, a different uh, letter here. Let's use a uh, little m. So I don't want you to think these have to be the same k. So now we'll choose an integer bigger than both m1 and, and m2, and show that it works. Choose m to be m0 plus m1. Then. Now we need to show this works. And if n is bigger than or equal to m, so uh, this, so let me actually make a, a first observation before I go to the n bigger than or equal to capital M. Then simply because we, um, and since n sub k, is bigger than or equal to k for all k a natural number, just because the n sub k is there, an increasing sequence of integers, uh, which starts at least at 1. Um, then since uh, n sub k is bigger than or equal to k for all k, this implies that the integer n sub capital M is bigger than or equal to m, which remember is m0 plus m1 which implies that n sub m is bigger than or equal to m0, and n sub m is bigger than or equal to m1. OK, so I just wanted to make that uh, this preliminary um, observation. And now we'll go to showing that this capital M works. So now, if n is bigger than or equal to capital M, I look at x sub n minus x in absolute value and add and subtract x sub m capital M capital M minus x and use the triangle inequality then okay so since n is bigger than or equal to capital M, which is bigger than or equal to m0. That means n is bigger than or equal to m0. And then n sub m, we just showed, is bigger than or equal to m0. So by um, this inequality, I get that the first term is less than epsilon over 2. And now n sub m, OK, so m is certainly bigger than or equal to m sub 1, and therefore, um, 
I will get that this part is less than epsilon over 2 because of this inequality. Okay? So uh, that capital choice of capital M works. And now, we'll prove the following, that a sequence is convergent if and only if it's Cauchy. So this is a two-way street, so we need to show the left uh, implies the right, and then the right implies the left, okay? All right, so um, this direction is, in fact, easy. Uh, based on what we've done, I shouldn't say it's easy, but, but what we've done so far, it, it quickly follows. Um, Assuming x sub n is Cauchy, I'm trying to show it's convergent, then, so if x sub n is Cauchy, this implies that x sub n is bounded, the sequence is bounded, which implies by the bolzano weierstrass theorem that x sub n has a convergent subsequence. And by the theorem we just proved, if a Cauchy sequence has a convergent subsequence, uh, it must be convergent. Now for the converse direction, that xn is convergent implies um, xn is Cauchy, well, I mean, so this should not come as a surprise. Let me draw a picture. Um, let's suppose x sub n is converging to x and epsilon is positive. Then since the xn's are converging to x, if I go to, uh, if I draw a little interval around x of length, total length epsilon, so x minus epsilon over 2 and x plus epsilon over 2, then I will find as long as, so then there exists m, so that for all n bigger than or equal to capital M, all of the x sub n's lie in this um, interval, yeah? They all lie in this interval because they have to be within distance epsilon over 2 to x, okay? If the xn's are converging to x. And since they lie in this interval, the distance between any two of them can only be as big as the length of the interval, which is epsilon, all right? So uh, this is essentially the picture of why a convergent sequence has to be Cauchy. So now let's turn this picture into math. We have to verify that uh, we have to verify xn is Cauchy through the definition. That's all we have. So let epsilon be positive. Since the xn's converge to x, there exists an integer m sub 0, natural number, such that for all n bigger than or equal to m sub 0, x sub n minus x is less than epsilon over 2. Uh, and so we'll choose the m for our definition of uh, Cauchy to be this m sub 0. And if n is bigger than or equal to m, and k is bigger than or equal to m, and I look at the absolute value of x sub n minus x sub k, and add and subtract x, 
and use the triangle inequality, this is less than or equal to x of n minus x in absolute value plus x minus x sub k. Each of these is less than epsilon over 2, um, since n is bigger than or equal to capital M and k is bigger than or equal to capital M, so this is less than epsilon over 2 plus epsilon over 2 equals epsilon, and therefore xn is Cauchy. Okay? Now, I want to make a brief remark about the previous theorem. Um, so remember how this whole story started off? We were, um, there was something wrong with the rational numbers. Namely, they didn't contain the square root of 2. Um, so we couldn't solve, you know, the algebraic equation x squared minus 2 equals 0. Um, but this also then turned into uh, the rationals not being um, complete in the sense of order. Not every bounded set, non-empty bounded set, has a, had a supremum. It didn't have the least upper bound property. Um, but you can also interpret this lack of having square root of 2 um, as uh, somehow saying that the rationals are incomplete in this sense. So uh, hopefully by, hopefully at the end of this class we'll be able to get to metric spaces, but um, so what do I mean by that? Let's say I look at this statement now within the universe of uh, rational numbers. So, so now uh, if this sequence is rational numbers, meaning um, sequences are only sequences of rational numbers, limits are only uh, elements of the rational numbers, epsilon is only a rational number, and so on, then, you know, we still have many of the same theorems that we proved, not all of them, and I'll, I'll indicate which ones don't hold, um, but if we only work in rationals, then we always do have... Uh, Uh, convergence implies Cauchy, meaning convergent sequences are Cauchy, okay? But Cauchy sequences are not necessarily convergent, okay? Again, what's, what's the example here? What's the intuitive example? Take x sub n uh, so that x sub n is in Q and now viewed in uh, the universe of real numbers, x sub n's converge to root 2. then such a sequence would be a Cauchy sequence, okay? I mean, we just proved that, basically. Um, so such a sequence would be a Cauchy sequence of rational numbers. However, it would not converge in the set of rational numbers. It would converge to the square root of 2, which is not a rational number. So because the square root of 2 is not a rational number, this shows that the rational numbers do not have this completeness property that Cauchy sequences converge, okay? Um, so there's a whole, still to this day, kind of industry of, deal, of studying spaces for which uh, Cauchy is equivalent to convergent. Uh, these are called complete metric spaces, and then if you add a little more structure, they're called Banach spaces and so on, um, which are very important, not just in math, but uh, also for um, formulating rigorously a lot of uh, the underlying um, uh, assumptions in, uh, for mathematical physics. But um, 
So for, if we're just looking inside the rationals, it does not follow that Cauchy sequences always converge. Okay, and now let's just stop for a minute and take stock of why this was true for the real numbers. Okay, what did we use going back? So um, if you think, if you really go back to um, the proof of the bolzano weierstrass so that's what we used here, right, to show that Cauchy sequences converge. Um, we use the fact that the limb soup and the limb inf always exists, okay? And limb soup and limb inf, you know, first off, they're defined to be soups and imps, which may not always exist as rational numbers, as we've already shown, so um, that, uh, that's definitely a problem already there. But even more so, you know, when we proved that every bounded monotone sequence converges, what we showed was that this limit is actually a soup of a certain set or an inf of a certain set, which again may or may not exist if we're just looking in the rational numbers because the rational numbers do not have the least upper bound property. So it really is the least upper bound property that gives us convergence uh, equivalent to Cauchy uh, for the real numbers. So um, for R, the least upper bound property is, I mean, it has to be because that, that's the main thing that separates the two uh, fields, so is, but I'm just reiterating this here, is the reason why convergent is equivalent to Cauchy. Now that I've proved that Cauchy is equivalent to, to convergence, maybe you'll ask, then why did we introduce it at all? I mean, if these two notions are the same, why prove, you know, why even introduce them if they're just convergent sequences already? And the reason is because, um, you know, to show that a sequence converges, you have to somehow have your hands on um, a candidate for the limit, right? If you want to um, prove that xn converges, you have to somehow come up with an x that it converges to. And it's not always clear how to find that x, okay? Um, but Cauchy, although it's equivalent to convergent in the set of real numbers, doesn't require you to find a candidate for convergence, okay? All it requires you to do is show that, you know, as long as you go far enough out, any two entries in the sequence are close together, okay, without requiring you to come up with a limit. See, computing limits is quite difficult. We're about to do series, right? And there's maybe like, I don't know, five series people can compute explicitly. But you do know that there's a ton of other series that are actually convergent, even though you don't know what the limit is. And why, why do you know that? It's simply, this is exactly because and exactly why um, people thought of Cauchy sequences to begin with, much of analysis. So again, just to, to summarize this, um, you know, convergent sequences are nice, but in practice it's difficult to get your hands on what could be a limit of a, of a sequence, especially if that sequence is pretty in, uh, complicated. So if you're trying to show a certain sequence converges, it suffices by what we've done here to show that it's Cauchy. And that's a little bit easier to do because that just requires you to work with the original sequence. You don't have to come up with a limit. You can just take your sequence and start um, playing directly with the entries rather than uh, try to come up with uh, a limit explicitly. So, okay, so that's what we're going to move on to is series now, which, as I said a minute ago, is the original reason why um, people uh, started developing the foundations of analysis, you know, what we're talking about right now to begin with, because they were just um, kind of 
doing very for very formal things that ended up uh, not making sense, like trying to add up. Uh, they were adding infinitely many positive numbers and coming up with a negative number. Um, well, that can't be right. So all of this was was created, discovered, however you want to phrase it, to uh, put on on rigorous foundations. Um, this next topic, which is series. So, and I mean, you dealt with series, you know, as a in calculus, so you know what a series is. Uh, maybe you don't remember all the proofs of the properties of series, but you know, it suffices to say this is, you know, series is a pretty good motivation since it's one of the most useful things uh, that comes out of math. I mean, series are how you solve. Um, series expansions are how you solve ODEs, PDEs, um, you know, Taylor expansions, all these things are in some sense a form of series, so being able to justify them as, as being real things is, um, is a necessity. So the definition of a series for now is really it's just uh, the symbol I'm about to write down. So given a sequence x sub n, the symbol or maybe I'll just sometimes write just sum x sub n is what's called the series associated to the sequence x of n. So right now, that's just a symbol. Um, we're going to interpret this as a real number uh, in the following situation. We say that the series converges series converges if the following sequence given by S sub uh, M equals, so what is um, this, so S sub M, this is the element of the sequence. And what is it? It is the actual sum. So this is not a formal thing. This is just a finite sum from n equals 1 to m. So this is so this sequence now, m equals 1 to infinity, uh, and these guys we called we call partial sums. converges. Okay? So right now if we just have a sequ if we just have a sequence x of n this the series associated to that uh, sequence is just a symbol, okay? We say that this series converges if this sequence of partial sums um, converge and if uh, s is this limit write S is equal to uh, the series uh, and treat the series now as a number. Okay. So in general, if I have a sequence, I just have this formal uh, symbol which I'm writing down, which I call a series associated to it. Uh, in the case that the sequence of partial sums converges, then I actually identify this series with a real number uh, and treat it as a real number. Okay? 
And um, so the way I've written this, the series is starting at 1, but uh, it doesn't necessarily have to. So just by, you know, shifting the index. Um, so let me just say here that we don't necessarily have to start series at n equals 1, okay? So this could be sum from n equals 0 to infinity, in which case we have a sequence starting now at x sub 0, all right? Or this could be starting at 2, in which place the, the sequence of x sub n starts at n equals 2. And then the sequence of partial sums would start at not m equals 1, but m equals 0 or m equals 2, okay? Depending on where the series starts. Okay, so some examples. The series sum from n equals 1 to infinity 1 over n, n plus 1 times n. This is a uh, convergent series, okay? So why is this? So let's look at the proof. So we look at the mth partial sum. This is the sum from n equals 1 to m of 1 over n plus 1 n, and this is equal to, um, now if I uh, write 1 over n plus 1 times n as 1 over n minus 1 over n plus 1, this is now the sum of 1 over n plus, these are finite sums, so I can always split them up. This should be a minus. And so now this is equal to 1 plus a half plus, plus 1 over m minus 1 half plus a third plus 1 over m plus 1 over m plus 1. And you see all of these cancel, and all that's left is 1 minus 1 over m plus 1. So the mth partial sum is equal to 1 minus 1 over m plus 1, and therefore the sequence of partial sums is the limit as m goes to infinity of this, which is just 1. And therefore this, sequence conver this uh, series converges. Um, now, uh, our favorite sequence, which does not converge, will give us a series which does not converge. So let's look at sum from n equals 1 to infinity and minus 1 to the n. This uh, does not converge. So what's the proof? The nth partial sum, this is equal to uh, minus 1 plus 1 plus minus 1 up until I get minus 1 to the m. And therefore, this is always equal to um, one of two things. If m is odd, then I have an odd number of these guys, and therefore, the minuses and pluses cancel, just leaving a minus 1 in the end, this last one, the odd one. And m is odd. And 0, if m is even, if I've add up an even number of uh, these terms, then all of the minus 1s and 1s cancel out, so I just get 0. And Therefore, this sequence, which is just minus 1 for m odd, uh, 0 for m even, does not converge. 
and therefore the series does not converge. So when I write to, when I write this, this is just a symbol. This is just chalk on a chalkboard. It doesn't mean anything. All right, so let's go to another series which does converge, and this is kind of um, the one to which we compare all other series, essentially, as you'll see. Um, you know, you have all these series tests that you remember, hopefully, from calculus um, that uh, tells you when a series converges, but um, maybe if you remember the proof or don't, how you do that is you converge it to one series which you do know how to sum. So it was just by pure luck we were able to convert, you know, compute the, the sum or compute the explicit series for this guy. Um, another one which we can do that for is a geometric series. So the theorem is if I have a real number with absolute value less than one, then the series starting now at zero, r to the n, converges, and I can actually compute the sum of this series, and this is one over one minus r. Okay. So what's the uh, proof? Um, let's look at the partial sums and. We can actually compute these as well, uh, just as we were able to do for, for the first example. We compute that the sum from n equals 0 to m of r to the m. Now you can prove this by induction. I think, I cannot exactly remember if I did this. Um, I, I believe I did in the second lecture on induction first or second lecture on induction, but if I add up uh, some number raised to the nth, so this should be to the n, uh, nth power from 0 to m, this is equal to 1 minus r to the m plus 1 over 1 minus r. Okay? And uh, I guess two lectures ago, we proved that if the absolute value, so let me state this now, uh, From two lectures ago, we proved that if the absolute value of r is less than 1, then limit as, let's make it m, of r to the m equals 0, which implies that, uh, so this was the mth partial sum which implies that the limit as m goes to infinity of s sub m equals the limit as m goes to infinity of this thing, which is, if you like, this is, okay, so that plus one there just multiplies r to the m by r, um, and using the algebraic facts we proved about limits is one minus r times zero over one minus r, which equals one over one minus r. So now you ask about the other, um, what about r bigger than 1? Well, when r equals minus 1, then we get the second example we looked at. If we get r equals 1, um, then that's just summing up 1, and you, uh, I leave it to you to, to check that that does not converge. Um, that the sequence of partial sums, if I just sum up 1 from n equals 0 to m, is um, equal to m plus 1, which does not converge. All right. And let me make just a, a kind of silly comment. And Maybe I didn't explicitly make this comment about uh, sequences. Maybe I forgot to do that as well. So um, for a sequence, a sequence, so you could, 
start your sequence, not necessarily at the first entry. Maybe you look at uh, a, if you like, new sequence where, uh, well, okay, so we know from sequences that subsequences of convergent sequences converge. So if I, instead of looking at the whole sequence, start at, uh, let's say, x100, and then go x101, x102, and that's the sequence I look at, well, that's a subsequence of the original one, which, uh, if it converges, implies that subsequence converges. So all that is to say, um, and for this simple way of, of obtaining this new sequence, all, all of that is to say that to understand if a sequence converges, I don't have to consider what happens for the first uh, finitely many uh, terms in the sequence, meaning, um, you know, a sequence x sub n converges if and only if uh, a sequence starting now at, say, n equals 100, 101, 102, 100, and so, 103, and so on, converges, okay? And the same is true for a uh, series, that uh, a series converges if and only if, um, you know, a series converges now starting at a different uh, point along the sequence. So this is um, the following theorem. Um, let xn be a sequence and let capital M be a natural number. Then n equals 1 to infinity of x sub n, this converges if and only if the sequence now starting at capital M converges. Meaning when I have to decide whether a series converges or not, it doesn't matter uh, what's going on for the first finitely many terms. Okay. What matters is what's going on as I keep, uh, you know, adding terms from further and further out of this sequence. Um, and what's the proof? The proof is just expressing the partial sums for this guy in terms of the partial sums for this guy. So sum satisfy for all m, uh, sum from n equals 1 to m, and now uh, x sub n as sum from n equals capital M to m x sub n plus sum from n equals um, 1 to capital M minus 1 x sub n. Okay, so this is now just a fixed number. So this is a sequence of partial sums um, corresponding to this, se this series. This is a sequence of partial sums corresponding to this series. And this is just a fixed number. Therefore, if this converges, then this side converges to this plus this fixed number. So maybe I'm, I'm going a little quick. but uh, So if this converges, then this converges to this minus this number. And if uh, this converges, then this sequence of uh, partial sums converges to this limit plus uh, this fixed number. Okay? And, and that's all I'm going to write. Okay? Now, coming back to um, the usefulness of Cauchy sequences. I mean, this is kind of where they really become useful. It's in the study of series. Because again, it's difficult to sum. So when I keep talking, saying the word sum a series, I'm talking about um, you know, find the limit of partial, uh, partial sums. Um, but because we have this equivalence between Cauchy sequences and convergent sequences, um, to decide if a series is convergent or not, 
um, we can just decide if, in some sense, it's, it's Cauchy or not. So let me make this um, definition. We say that a series x of n is Cauchy if the sequence of partial sums, again, these are, um, I'm just going to put an m up top because this may start at 0 or n equals 1 or something. So uh, the sequence of partial sums is Cauchy. OK? And so let me just uh, restate what we proved for sequences in terms of series. So we proved that every Cauchy sequence is convergent. So uh, a series is Cauchy if and only means that the sequence of partial sums is Cauchy. But we've proven that se Cauchy sequences are convergent. So if this is Cauchy, then it's convergent and vice versa. So based on what we've uh, proven already for sequences, it follows that, and this just follows immediately from what we've proven already, so I'm not even going to write a proof. Um, a series is Cauchy if and only if the series is convergent. Again, because both are defined in terms of the sequence of partial sums associated to the series. And we've already proven the equivalence between Cauchy and convergence for sequences. Now, let me write what it means to be Cauchy in a slightly uh, different way. And it's the following. So so um, before we had that uh, a sequence is Cauchy intuitively if um, the elements of the sequence are getting close uh, to each other. Now, for a series to be Cauchy, uh, the intuitive way to think about it is that the tail of the sum is getting small, OK? Is getting uh, arbitrarily small. Tail of the sum being if I add up um, finitely many numbers uh, far enough out. So uh, a series is Cauchy if and only if for all epsilon positive. There exists an m natural number such that uh, for all integers l bigger than m, which is bigger than or equal to capital uh, m, sum from n equals n plus 1 to l of x of n. So this is a, a sum involving terms that are pretty far out. They're at least uh, all. Um, indexed by something bigger than or equal to capital M is less than epsilon. Okay, so a series is Cauchy if you're kind of adding up smaller and smaller pieces. Not individual pieces, but actual, like, adding those up. Okay, so uh, I'll leave it to you to do kind of I mean, they're both pretty easy, but this direction, um, uh, I'll leave it to you as an exercise, and it'll follow immediately from what I'm going to write for essentially this direction. Um, so let's suppose, uh, and let's make things concrete starting somewhere. Let's suppose this sum is Cauchy. We want to prove now that it has this property. Okay? So let epsilon be positive. We now want to produce some capital number M so that this holds. So since 
the sequence of partial sums, S sub m, is Cauchy. That's what uh, it means for the series to be Cauchy. There exists a natural number, capital M, such that um, for all uh, m bigger than or equal to m naught and l uh, bigger than or equal to m naught, s sub m minus s sub l is less than epsilon. So let's, uh, we're actually going to take capital M to be this M naught. Choose M to be M naught. Then if uh, L is bigger than, or is bigger than M, which is bigger than or equal to M naught, uh, bigger than or equal to M, which is equal to M naught, if I look at this sum from N equals m plus 1 to l, x sub n, I can write this, so this is absolute value. Um, so in fact, let me remove the absolute value so that this becomes pretty clear. I can write this sum as the lth partial sum minus the mth partial sum, right? Because the lth partial sum sums from n equals 1 up to l. The mth partial sums from n equals 1 up to m. So the sum containing only the terms between m plus 1 and l is the difference of these guys. Um, so now I'll put on absolute values. And this thing, because l and m are bigger than or equal to capital M, which is equal to m naught, and because I have this inequality, this is less than epsilon. Okay? And the converse direction, again, it follows immediately, essentially, from uh, this uh, equality here. All right. So to check whether a series converges, I don't have to somehow come up with a um, limit for this series, a sum for this series. I can just show, I can just prove that kind of the tail can be made arbitrarily small as long as I go far enough out um, in the series. And from this, we get a, a pretty simple elementary uh, property, so theorem. If a series converges, then this implies that the limit as n goes to infinity of x of n of the uh, sequence you use to obtain the series equals zero. Okay, so this should you know fall in line with um, you know a, a series being convergent if and only if it satisfies this property here, right? Which is somehow saying uh, the tail of the sum is getting smaller and smaller, which means you can't be adding up big things. Uh, um, as you go on out in the in the series. So proof. Um, so we'll show this by um, a simple epsilon delta or epsilon uh, m definition. So suppose x in converges, then x in the series is Cauchy. And now I'm going to verify uh, this using the epsilon uh, m definition. Um, let epsilon be positive. Since x in is Cauchy, this implies that there 
exists a natural number m naught uh, such that for all l bigger than or equal to m bigger than or equal to m naught, um, I have that condition there, sum from n equals m plus 1 uh, um, to l x sub n is less than epsilon. choose m to be m naught plus 1, okay? This, so why m naught plus 1 but not exactly m naught just because um, basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to take L to be equal to m plus 1 and the index gets shifted by 1. Then if m is bigger than or equal to m, I get that the absolute value of x sub m, so I'm, maybe I'll, instead of saying limit as n goes to infinity, I'll write limit as m goes to infinity, it's just a change in the dummy variable. This is equal to um, sum from n equals m to m x sub n, and now so I've, I've shifted this, so now little m is bigger than or equal to capital M naught plus 1. Um, so you could write this as, if you like, m minus 1 plus 1. So little m minus 1 is bigger than or equal to m naught. So by this inequality, this is less than epsilon. And so we see that if a series converges, the terms, the individual uh, terms, x sub n, must converge to 0. So there's another reason why this series minus 1 to the n does not converge, because those terms do not converge. Um, and this also tells us that uh, for this geometric, series when r is greater than or equal to 1 in absolute value, the series does not converge. Does not converge, okay? And the proof is, um, and we proved this, uh, in fact, um, I think a few lectures ago, a few lectures ago as well, that um, if the absolute value of r is bigger than 1, then limit as n goes to infinity of r to the n, this limit does not exist. We showed it's in fact unbounded, right? This is r to the n is an unbounded um, sequence. Uh, so. does not converge. So um, I'm using that theorem over there in a little bit roundabout way. Let me, uh, let me state let me restate this theorem over here. This theorem says uh, if the series converges, then the series, uh, the lim this limit equals zero. Now this statement is logically equivalent to uh, the negation of the converse, or, or the, um, there, there's an actual word for that, but I, I can't remember. Namely, that uh, the negation of this implies the negation of this, okay? So a logically equivalent way to rewrite that statement over there is that that if this limit does not equal to zero, so if it doesn't exist at all, that's also uh, fine. This implies that does not converge. Okay, so, you know, this, um, 
restatement of the theorem over there is really what I use to, to prove, uh, is really what I use here. Okay. All right, and I think I'll stop there. Um, next time we'll see that this theorem here is a one-way street, and I think you covered this, this example in probably calculus, namely that um, one-way street in the sense that if xn converges, then this limit is zero, but the converse does not hold. Namely, it is not true that if the limit, if this limit is zero, then this uh, converges. Okay, and we'll see the um, famed harmonic series next time.